Hello, everybody. Um, we're recording now. Um, this is the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Um, and today it's an honor to have um, Michael Oler talk about a new um, privacy initiative by Google. Um, Mike received his PhD from Cyber Defense Lab a few years ago and has been uh, working for the Department of Defense and the, and the Naval Academy. So uh, welcome, Michael Oler. Thank you very much, Dr. Sherman, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And again, thanks uh, everyone for allowing me to use such a provocative uh, title uh, for uh, today's discussion. It really is a uh, hotbed of um, concern. Uh, so let's get into how uh, the world of the internet and advertising is going to change what that means. Now, give me a moment as I work out here. Is it down? Is it left? Next. Great. So this is a really strange time for me. Um, after decades upon decades of doing presentations, um, I was always affiliated with one organization or another. This is the first time pretty much in all of my life that I've actually spoken as myself. So you can see here that I've been involved with cyber for so, so many uh, years and um, moved on to a, a different um, area of my life. And I have to absolutely thank uh, all of the wonderful people that I worked with at UMBC to get that PhD. It made such a difference at the tail end of my career. You can see here the phrase that we use, you know, within our own little community is it got me my 15, meaning that final terminal promotion uh, is one that just continually gives um, rewarding dividends, you know, year after year after after year uh, as, as I'm in retirement now. Um, also, by getting that, and as Dr. Sherman uh, said, allowed me to finish uh, um, my final rotation down at the uh, Naval Academy. What a wonderful opportunity that was. So, again, um, much gratitude uh, goes out to everyone that has helped me uh, from, from UMBC. Okay. Hey, so, you know, this is uh, probably going to be a little bit different than from what uh, many of you have, have seen. Um, you know, this isn't where, you know, I give you a little agenda or so. What I'm trying to do is reflect the kind of presentation style that I was expected to do for most of my career when interacting uh, with the military. Um, you know, they readily admit that they have only a brief moment, um, you know, to give to you. And yeah, you can see down there, I have 54 slides. I'm not going to be doing 54 slides, but you know, most of the senior commanders, uh, senior executives on the civilian side that I would work with, you know, would not be able to sit through you know, a, a lengthy presentation like this. So their point is just give it to me. What is it that I need to know? So in this case, the federated learning of cohorts is a Google initiative to change the web as we know it. Um, I've seen people go as far as saying the intent of flock is to codify advertising into everything we do on the web. And centrally, what happens here is that your interests are grouped into called a label. Uh, I already used the word group. Uh, Google uses the word cohort. And then that cohort, that number, that label representing your interests is said. Now, Google comes. Come, uh, sorry, Google says that this is, you know, to your advantage because, you know, you're no longer being tracked with cookies as the way uh, things are done today, but instead only sharing your specific interest. But by doing so, you know, you may then expose yourself, you know, your unique identity. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And if you are interested in perhaps a area that a government doesn't approve of, then you may be subject to uh, persecution. So this is why Flock is such a hotbed. All right, the other part of you know, my uh, career is after you, you hit hard and you give them the bottom line and you gotta give the, uh, uh, the senior 
you know, some sort of idea of what's going to happen going forward. You know, so here, what I've had to do is temper um, uh, this, this notion that we've got to, you know, jump through hoops or chicken little, the sky is falling by letting you know that at this point in time, all browser manufacturers have declined to implement Google's uh, flock technique. And there have been various lawsuits that have been filed. But I think from a senior's perspective, um, you know, giving away uh, your interest you know, in mass and at every time you visit a website is a serious concern. Um, from a government perspective, yeah, th this is fairly obvious. There will be policy uh, coming down through our STIG process uh, to take you know, one side or another with regards to flock. I'll talk about in a few slides about how a web server can actually block Google's web crawler from judging that website's areas of interest. So, you know, again, through policy, you know, DOD wide policy, we could perhaps put out a stake. Now, many of the leaders, you know, want to know where, you know, they would use the word cyber terrain, you know, flock is, is placed. Um, you know, so this multi uh, dimensional uh, figure is, is very common in cyber training. And I was really, Glad to see this came out of the yeah, CDOE uh, paper, a recent paper. Um, and I would tell you that flock occurs at our logical plane, you know, at our network protocol, um, HTTP uh, layer. Um, you know, this is not a, a physical thing or an administrative thing. You know, flock is literally placed at the logical uh, layer. So I struggled here, and I feel as when I put this presentation together, there is a, a huge jump. You know, I went from just a, you know, a cyber terrain picture and jumping in towards a web server. I truly wanted a slide in here with flock on the user's browser. Um, but I really struggled um, to get the technical detail necessary uh, to come across with a coherent uh, point. We're going to get to that in a moment here, but what I will show you is that from a server perspective, you can easily, a server administrator can easily disable um, their site from being flocked by uh, web crawlers. It's a simple HTTP, HTTP header. Um, you can see part of permission policy uh, here. And at that point, uh, the site wouldn't be recorded. All right, I want to give you a little bit of the uh, current lay of the land. Um, hopefully, this will be a pretty uh, um, general uh, for for many of you. Um, you know, hopefully, you all realize that uh, today's internet it's all about eyeballs. Um, so you can see this, you know, interesting thought here on the screen for yourself. Um, just to establish a sort of a philosophy as how things are are done. Um, you know, there are many uh, well-spoken uh, people that, you know, make it quite clear of what's going on in today's uh, internet. You can see here, you know, there is a, a Google, oh, sorry, a TED talk, um, you know, about uh, how we're all being trapped every single time you go out on, on the web. So I'm using the words, you know, tracked. Um, I think the industry uses the word uh, behavioral tracking more often, but you can see that overall, this is a concerted effort to amass information about you so that they can sell you products they think you are interested in. Now, notice then that we have to compare that with fingerprinting. Now, tracking is not fingerprinting. Tracking is yeah, you know, what has been going on for a long time? People are becoming a little bit aware of this and they're beginning to put in ad blockers. So consequently, the advertisers have upped the game by fingerprinting your system. 
the immutable properties that they can garner out of JavaScript are then used to track where you're going throughout the web. Now, so this is different you know, than fingerprinting versus you know, the traditional uh, web tracking, watching your behavior. So make sure you're aware of those two, uh, two points. So let's go back and talk about classical you know, web tracking. It's all fundamentally based on a cookie. A cookie is nothing more than information that is saved either uh, temporarily on your browser or on your computer's hard disk. This information, this cookie is sent to the site that gave you the cookie each and every time you go there. Now, I'm bringing up some finer detail here with regards to first and third party cookies uh, because we've got a pretty interesting, I hope this is gonna work if the PowerPoint gods are with me, uh, interesting graph example coming up here in a moment. So real quick, a first party cookie is that information that is given to you by the site you went to. Go to Amazon, get Amazon's cookie. That's a first party cookie. But by going to Amazon, uh, a whole slew of other uh, images, uh, you know, kinds of metadata, uh, files, media, you know, are obtained from other uh, sites. And these are known then as the third party uh, cookies. So let's see if I can get you yeah, an uh, example. I know this is a little bit busy, but the slide shows you a user's browser on the left, a web server on the right, a HTML git request, uh, sorry, an HTTP git request going across the internet. Notice that there was no you know, cookie sent in that HTTP header. So going back from the right to the left, highlighted in yellow, you can see that the server sends you a cookie, the information they want to store about you along with the actual web page itself. And that web page then is highlighted in blue. And as you can see within the HTML itself, there's just some sort of image looks like it's to, you know, buy something special now, but that image has got to be fetched from another website. Another get request is, you know, sent out across the network over to the advertisers web server, wherein another cookie, that third party cookie is sent back to you. All right, so this is the simplistic view of how web tracking works. I think you can uh, uh, see in this slide that I just spoke about, you know, the example of the previous slide, the first and third party cookie from the advertiser. I'm gonna to get to an example here in just a moment to this demo, but from that simple example, I hope you don't uh, have any trouble seeing that your whole browsing history of where you are going across the internet can now be tracked. And all of this information can be amassed about what you are doing. So Google has said that the whole point of Flock is to just send your interest. And the initial thought was that this is privacy preserving. This is much better than, you know, all of those third party cookies uh, floating around. All right, let's take a look at this, uh, this little example. Um, I've got two, uh, we'll see if this first one works. If not, I'm just gonna go uh, uh, onto a second one. But in this first example, I bring out a utility called Collusion. It's a visualization um, tool that actually graphs your accessing all of the third party uh, cookies as uh, you go out on, on the internet. Um, you can see here that a gray dot in this little example is the website you visited and the red dots are all of the advertisers that are, are tracking uh, you. Um, so in this case, uh, in this collusion demo, um, I hope I have the URL for this gentleman's uh, demo. You can see that he goes to the movie database, the New York Times, Huffington Post, uh, GameSpot, and then uh, reference. So here, let's cross our fingers at uh, WebEx. The gods and PowerPoint all work. So you begin by just clicking and it goes off to the internet movie database and voila, one gray dot and get three trackers. So now you go on to your next site. I think it's the New York Times. That's the second gray dot. 
and all of a sudden we have some linkage occurring. You know, the tracking has begun. So let's go off to our third site. I think it's the Huffington Post. Ooh, looks like we're independent. No, not at all. And all of a sudden, you know, your tracking is uh, underway. And I think this may be the final site, um, but all of a sudden, you know, it, it just, this, this intricate web, you know, just, just goes on and on. So again, I hope that um, that little demo worked. Uh, you can hover over it, you know, where you're going, who the trackers uh, are and all. Um, I apologize, I should have put the, uh, the URL, you know, out there. Uh, for this gentleman's uh, uh, demo, you can go take a look at it afterwards if you like. Um, if my demo didn't work, uh, there is another one that does another utility that does the same thing called Lightbeam. And now I just went to, I thought, innocuous Craigslist, a uh, pinball website, uh, some news media, the movie database, a YouTube, and Microsoft. And oh, let me go back. I was hoping I can uh, expand this a little bit, but all of a sudden you can see there are now dozens of advertisers that are involved in this and are well aware of you know, what I am doing. Um, if you wanna look a little bit more about Lightbeam, I, I would you know, highly suggest that you do so. They go on to uh, state, you know, how do they determine that these are you know, trackers and you know, the databases that they use on the back end for, for all of this, but just me going to one, two, three, four, five, six sites, I was just utterly amazed at you know the overall interconnectivity across the uh, the web. Okay, so now you know how bad things are, you know, currently. So let's talk about what we can do. Um, I always teach about something called uh, discretionary access control. Uh, just more simply, you know, access control that allows the users to uh, um, you know manipulate the privileges to uh, uh, we would have said in the day uh, subjects these days, uh, perhaps we could use the word resources. So in this case, the cookie is the resources. So what, what can you actually do you know, to control access to your cookies? And what we find is that within all of our browsers, we have access control you know, to prevent cookies, uh, to remove cookies you know, after you exit, um, to permit you know, cookies a uh, uh, long, long term. It's a difficult, um, capability uh, to use. Um, I'm hesitant to say that many people actually are aware and e even use this uh, form of access control. Many people also come, uh, claim that, you know, let's not worry about all of this uh, web tracking and behavioral analysis that's being done about us because I have the ability to do not track. Well, it turns out that this is just optional. All you can do is say in your uh, Git request, oh, please, don't track me. And do you have any idea if that is actually, you know, abided by? None of us really, really do. So I don't see this as a good uh, solution. At this point in the presentation, I thought I would go off and, you know, do a whole, you know, brouhaha about you know, incognito mode and private browsing mode. And that just got uh, off onto a, a tangent. Uh, that's my polite way of saying perhaps you can ask me back and we'll we'll talk about these uh, these things uh, at another time. All right, you know, as we uh, finish up here talking about the uh, the lay of the land. Um, really cool website out there that'll check, you know, whether um, you are flocked, whether or not your browser is um, part of the uh, early beta testing. I believe that Google uses the uh, term origin tester. Um, I did, I went out and uh, no, I was not flocked. So let's talk, you know, move away from the, the lay of the land and a little bit about uh, flock itself. Um, uh, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing here. You'll, you'll see how I, I failed uh, a little flat uh, for what I had hoped to achieve for today. Um, but let's let's talk about the uh, the beginnings of, of flock. And um, I want you all to know that Google announced back in 2019 that Chrome would remove cookies. Uh, this was earth shattering. Um, the industry, the marketing, uh, the advertising industry was shocked to its core. They call this 
cookie apocalypse. And they are truly, truly afraid of, of what's um, around the corner uh, for them. This will literally shake, Flock literally shakes them, uh, uh, their business uh, uh, to the core. Um, oh, I can't double click there. Okay, click here instead. <laughs> 2023 is when Google claims that Flock is uh, coming out. So really, it's very simple. Your interests are aggregated into a group. Google uses the term cohort. Uh, I've seen in some writings, people like to use the word label. It truly is this cohort group label. It's truly nothing more than a number. And all of us are probably asking, how then is this number generated? Um, yeah, well, let's let's talk a little bit about that, and that's where things get a little, little dicey, little little odd. All right, so just told you that a cohort is nothing more than a grouping of your interests. Um, some people use the word label, um, and you can see here's you know uh, uh, the web dev community's explanation for you know up here in these five bullet points, and they say, hey, look. We divvied some, you know, um, mathematical space, you know, into these cohorts, into these numbers, and perhaps, you know, one day you'll you'll be in four two seven seven, and then you'll slide as your interests change into a different uh, cohort, and then it is this uh, number that that is uh, sent. So I write the word unfortunately here because I'm alluding again to. Uh, uh, the little bugaboo that I encountered and you know, putting all of these thoughts together, getting there. All right, the overall problem. What has pissed off so many people? I guarantee you if you right now in your uh, side window, uh, just start Googling flock, there is very little good things uh, people are saying about it. You can see here the quote um, also appeared in the abstract of what the F, uh, EFF is, is saying. Um, again, the bottom line here is that if a cohort is improperly sized, you may be identified. Now, Google has countered this by saying the uh, size N for a cohort will be set at a minimum floor of 1,000. Well, I've heard it say in China that if you're one in 1,000, there are a million of you. Think about that. So many people are concerned that if a cohort is just too small, you may stand out like a sore thumb and you may be identifiable. Second thing here, and you can read this just as easily I can say, is if you are browsing to particular sites, your interest may be deemed unacceptable and thus subjecting yourself to uh, persecution. Now again, folks, sending every web server your interest is very different than sending a cookie to a site you have logged into. You know, I got a cookie to my bank. Okay, it's between my bank and I. I'm interested in shopping at Amazon. The cookie is between Amazon and I. Versus here, you're flocked, and that cohort goes to everyone. Okay, so we all want to know exactly then how this cohort, you know, from an algorithmic sense is you know, constructed. Um, what comes up over and over again, um, you know, from the developers themselves to uh, Google's marketing literature, uh, to blog sites, to, you know, people that are just rumbling about it in comments is the use of sim hash. Now you can tell from the name, this is a you know, concatenation for similarity hashing. Um, cool. So I want to, you know, introduce that notional idea, the use of, of sim hashing. Everything I write, every, sorry, everything I see, they write about the use of, you know, sim hashing. But then you see Google saying things like this. Um, 
you know, where they tell you that your browser will decide, you know, how then that uh, cohort is is calculated. I, I'm, you know, I, I get, I'm getting conflicting information. I, I feel as I try to put together all of all of these these thoughts about, you know, how is flock calculated. All right. So, you know, perhaps you're a network analyst, a firewall administrator. Uh, someone like myself who spent their life dealing with packet capture, you know, the first question then that I always ask is, yeah, how does this cohort appear, you know, in the HTTP header? You know, what, what is it that I would be looking for on, on the wire? And I could not, after hours and hours of searching, find how this was you know, actually sent o over the wire. No, no commentary, you know, an anywhere uh, on this. I am literally, you know, perplexed as as what to, you know, uh, say about this, and just got to got to conclude and move on to the next slide by saying I got to do some more more research as as to how this happens. All right, so you know, I say, you know, I've done my due diligence and I've looked out on the web to see how you know this cohort is is sent, and you know how how do we get access? You know, how can we see? Here are the two bullets, you know, within the. Uh, uh, Google's documentation. Now, maybe this makes sense. And if you are a full on web uh, designer, uh, you know, JavaScript uh, a coder extraordinaire, you know, maybe this absolutely makes sense to you. I'm over here. I don't know if my mouse pointer shows on the uh, uh, streaming, but Google says, yeah, you can obtain the cohort by running a little JavaScript code document dot interest cohort function, call to the uh, interest cohort uh, function. Uh, um, I don't know if this is an Ajax call or, you know, a, a um, you know, an actual JavaScript and that, you know, sends it back as a, sends back the cohort as a separate, um, you know, HTTPS, uh, uh, you know, connection. It just wasn't very fulfilling uh, uh, to me. It was also then interesting to see, you know, this little blurb, and this is all I ever find about it. You know, Google says that if you're a server and you want access to the cohort, you will have already filed for a token with us. And so then that this token must be sent to that Chrome browser before you'll gain access to the cohort. Okay, still really didn't answer, you know, my question about, you know, how is this sent on, on the wire? Still got to do some uh, investigation. All right, you can definitely see that um, you know, I've got a lot more slides. I'm really putting that out there as a teaser to have me come back. Um, I really want to talk about sim hash in and of itself, um, you know, how the algorithm works. Um, but for today, I'll just uh, wet your whistles and we're gonna talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the application, uh, the use of the uh, sim hash uh, um, code itself. I, here you can see, you know, did the classical uh, Python pip to install uh, sim hash and then um, created a string, sim hashed that string. It creates an object, created what I thought was a, oh, uh, was a similar uh, string. I just added an extra a, you know, word to it, hashed it, and then um, called the uh, the API to calculate the actual distance between these uh, two documents. And we get a zero. And it turns out that's a, a Hamming distance. Um, so the uh, documents are are very very similar. Um, so again, gives you an idea of how to use uh, the uh, Python module you know, from a programmatic standpoint. Now I did something a little bit more complex here. I began again with the same A string, created the sim hash object. You can see that it is nothing more than a value. And um, I'll, you know, give a little hint. Uh, um, it's a 64 bit value and it turned out that this, uh, module for SimHash was using MD5 under the cover. Uh, I won't be getting into uh, feature extraction today, but perhaps in another uh, discussion we, we could. And um, it was 
uh, 64 uh, bits. If I recall correctly, that's half of an MD5 um, uh, digest. And here, what I did is I tried to create the same sort of string. I put a uh, B out front and called the same distance function to calculate the uh, uh, similarity or disparity of the uh, two documents. And I get a, a number of uh, 26. It's a 26 bit uh, difference. Um, again, under the covers, we're using uh, uh, Hamming distance here. One final example. Um, this is you know, how I would have just simply done a, um, uh, a four word engram uh, for feature extraction. Um, you know, I, again, I don't know if my cursor appears, uh, but I'm in Python doing a uh, um, list iteration, list comprehension, um, creating an engram of four words. Then the second is the next word and the three further and so on and, and so on uh, to see if I could produce a, here we have it as a sim hash for the S string. Then I did a T string where I believed um, the phrasing was similar enough. Uh, again, I did some feature extraction and calculated the uh, sim hash for T and its distance. I got a distance of 24, which I found was surprising because I thought if I had, you know, brown fox and lazy dog and both of these strings, that they'd be a little bit closer. So again, you know, what you're seeing here is, you know, a initial use of you know, this sim hash uh, that Google uses, not just in Flock, but in other aspects of their uh, of their business. Uh, again, a very fundamental you know, um, uh, from a coder's perspective, uh, use of, of SimHash. My final uh, uh, thought here for today, you know, is a moment ago, I told you about how I was so uh, unhappy that I couldn't find anybody saying that they had, you know, how they actually used um, a sim hash to calculate the cohort. Um, there was a company that actually uh, published, uh, um, on, I think it was out on GitHub, you know, how they did it. And uh, they calculate a cohort as the historical concatenation of all of the domains that you had visited. Now, I don't know if this is a good approach um, you know, if I visit Amazon.com, you know, Microsoft.com, you know, the, uh, the word feature com, you know, appears over and over and over again. I don't know how that, you know, assists you in the calculation of, of similar in, in an effective manner. So again, I feel this is probably an area that the flock developers are going to improve on. Now I know they have grand visions to use, you know, and here come the buzzwords the uh, clustering algorithms and machine learning uh, approaches. So we know that uh, some changes will be coming, but I'm still very concerned that you know, the privacy um, issues with regards to Flock will, will exist. You know, for me and for anyone, and I'll open this up to, you know, uh, Dr. Sherman's, you know, graduate students, if this is an area, a topic that interests you, you know, I am more than happy to uh, work with you, um, you know, speak with you, share ideas. And you know, I think in doing so, my journey into this whole realm of data science you know, will, will happen uh, much quicker. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for your time and attention today. And I will turn this over to uh, Dr. Sherman. Thank you, Dr. Oler. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Hi, hello. Hi. Yeah, so um, early on in, in this presentation, you kind of mentioned how you could you could set like a little uh, like setting on, on your web server to sort of block Google's web crawler. Yes. Um, so would that also like block your web page from being indexed? 
by Google and showing up in relevant search results? Because that Good seems question. like a. I'm sorry. Yeah, go. Yeah, Colin, that's a great question. Whether or not um, uh, Google. Uh, would retaliate by not indexing you? That's a really good question, and I I don't I can't even you know uh, proclaim to you know say I know what Google is thinking in that regards. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, it just seems like this is sort of turning into like an uh, an arms race of advertising. Yeah, sense. I get really worried when I see words like you know multiple times people are saying that advertising is being codified into the core of the internet. Yeah. yeah others, sure. uh, others are, are very worried that um, the calculation of a cohort may not occur in a distributed or local fashion, that in fact, it may be turned over to a particular vendor. You know, they would then control the arena. Imagine that, right? Imagine yeah. if they're, you know, Imagine if Google, who's indexed a, a good portion, I won't say all the web, a good portion of the web, you know, suddenly has created um, you know, hundreds of billions of SIM hash entries and then uses that in the generation of the cohort. So mm -hmm. there, there's a level of indirection, you know, indirect addressing, if you would, where we have to all go through Google. Yeah. So far, Google is saying, no, 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 no. No, 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 that's not how it's going to work. And I'm worried because I can't find, uh, I hope from this presentation, you realize I'm a pretty detail oriented person mm -hmm. and I can't find that detail and that sufficient explanation. Yeah, there's not, not much of a guarantee there. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So Thank I'm you very much. Really, really worried. Thanks, Colin. In terms of privacy, can you compare um, Flock with existing cookies for both good and bad privacy characteristics. So in a comparison of flock with traditional cookies, it all boils down to uh, on one hand with cookies, you give up the entire T of your web history. Everywhere you go is known, right? If I show you, you know, this sort of graph, I mean, look at how many people are watching me as I went to this one circular uh, web server. I think it might have been ours, right? Versus on the other hand, Google is saying, no, no, Flock is preserving all of that privacy for you by only telling everyone your interests. There's a subtle difference there, but it brings up other concerns. Wow. This Are is, there other competing proposals? None that I, I uh, explicitly saw, um, mostly because this is a, a Google driven initiative. What I did see in my uh, um, research was that this uh, harkens back to the day of the um, um, Netscape versus uh, Internet Explorer. Who has the largest market share gets to dominate, you know, the design. And that, that is kind of worrisome and contrary to, you know, the initial philosophy of how the internet was put together. Is this a topic that excited anyone out, out there that's listening in today? A amazed, you know, just shocked perhaps? Um, how effective would it be if um, individuals use pseudonyms? So regardless of how they're tracked, at most the trackers only know about the pseudonyms, but not the connection between the real person. I'd like to actually then share those uh, pseudonyms with everyone else. Just every day, I'm just throwing out my <laughs> my flock to you and you to me and back and forth. <laughs> Maybe that's just too fanciful of a thought. Uh, what 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 I'd like to point out is that you know how much is Google valued at at this point? It, are they now a trillion dollar company? And so how much is invested in in internet advertising uh, these these days? Are are we perhaps you know approaching you know, a two trillion dollar industry? Um, you know again I'm not a business person, 
But I, I just throw that out as sort of a uh, retrospective uh, thought. Cyrus, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so I've I've had a, a decent interest in in advertising and its security problems since um, about 2016, 2017, uh, when there were a series of papers on Adint that got published in a wide variety of places. Um, I guess it, just a, a brief statement to queue up for anyone on the call who, I, I'm assuming you know, but for anyone on the call who doesn't know what Adint is, uh, you can serve ads fit, fitting a specific demographic to a specific type, to a specific hair color potentially, uh, and then serve it to a five meter by five meter area and serve a, an ad to the next five meter by five meter area and the next one. And based on the ads that get served to the person you're targeting on a given day, you can track their locations. Um, to to, to such a level of specificity, isn't that amazing? It, it's horrifying. Um, yeah, from what I can tell, Flock doesn't remove that location serving. Um, I, I just looked up briefly uh, uh, hmm. one of the papers, and it doesn't. It, it it gets rid of everything else. So now it's not hair color. Well, it could be hair color. That could be your cohort is is hmm. brown haired people. But it seems to not remove the ability to serve within a five meter by five meter area. Um, Oh, I was going to ask if if you if you knew if there's anything to mitigate this because this this essentially just seems like it's shoving me or shoving the addent problem down the road <laughs> without fixing anything. <laughs> yeah, just it's it, I I I I um, Cyrus, that's a, it was Cyrus, right? That's an amazing thought. You you've, you've caught me a little off guard to the point that I am now going to go. You've caught you piqued my interest. I am going to go look look and read up on this. That is so. Fascinating. Damn. So much, uh, uh, there's just so much that, that can be done uh, uh, here. Um, Dr. Short. What are your plans for um, continuing to work on this? Um, so you can see, I've already got my um, uh, slide deck together with regards to how SimHash algorithmically works. I, I want to get some sense of you know what what makes this tick. You know how how does this this work? Um, made phenomenal progress. Was literally ready until I got down to the last slide here, where there's one guy on the internet says no one writes about the steps that come next in uh, Google's approach of using SimHash in Flock and uh, addressing um, um, an n squared problem with regards to you know uh, judging uh, a hamming distance you know across multi-billion uh, uh, corpuses and uh, he says this is literally imperative to understanding how you know these um, cohort spaces if anybody remembers that little graph i had here you know, you've got to be able to group these sim hashes quickly together in a database. So where was this marketing mumbo jumbo? You know, here, you know, these these cohort spaces, and it all boils down to you know solving what, what's called the uh, Hamming distance uh, problem. And Google gets a little oblique about it. So this gentleman, the only person I saw on the net that uh, explains uh, how. He thinks Google is going about uh, uh, doing this. Maybe Google doesn't want to give it away as it's their secret sauce, you know, in, in all of this. Not sure yet. And so that's why I, I'd like to come back. Um, you know, even another student wants, wants to address this with me. Wonderful. But I uh, want to bridge this final, uh, you know, final thought process as to how uh, SimHash and Flock all come together. Thanks for that. Long winded explanation. So again, Are there any more questions? Well, with that, um, we thank you, Mike. Oh, I think Dr. Finan has a question. I'm trying to figure out how to pull up um, the little text window there. Dr. I can Finan, read it. Uh, uh, Dr. Finan asks, I wonder how techniques developed for large language models might produce better models than SimHash. Absolutely agree. And here's where I, I got to you know, 
complete ignorant. I'm not well versed in machine learning, NLP, and IR. My journey into data science begins. Now, I will say then that in the literature that I've been reading, um, Google and others, you know, claim that more robust techniques, you know, should be investigated. And I think that's what you're alluding to. And I agree. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, we appreciate it. It's an interesting talk. In two weeks, we'll have the final CDL talk of the fall, um, and it's going to be a presentation by um, representatives from the SFS cohort that did a study of shadow IT at UMBC. The SFS research study will take place the first week in January, um, and we're hoping that the subject of that study is going to be some cyber physical aspect of the security of the new inner life's interdisciplinary life sciences building at umbc so that should be interesting i hope everybody has a happy holiday we'll see you in two weeks thanks everyone